Now to our final speaker. Please welcome Gail Quornby. No, 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 no. <laughs> thank you, dear friends, for welcoming me. And I've had a lot to do with all of you. And thank you, Uncle Max, and everybody here for having me. Mm, I've got uh, childhood treasures in here. Shh, 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 shh. Don't tell. Anyway. It was, it was a hundred years ago that my father's life changed and in itself it changed my life um, incredibly. I was so grateful to hear everybody's story here and the, the one word that triggered with me was resilience. My dad was in the French First World War in the trenches there and, and he was left for three days in a pile of, of his dead mates and they were feeding him into a mass grave to, to be gone forever when they realised that he was just a little bit alive. Not very, just a little bit. And so Dad eventually got back to Australia in, I think it was about 1920 when he finally came here. And when he had left, he was a, a very fit country farm boy raised person who just assumed that he would go back to farming. But he was um, suggested to him that maybe he go to the city, that terrible thought, and just operate a, a lift in the city. And that, that would be like sending him to a, a horrible outcome. So, of course, he went out into the desert on camels, as you do. Have a look. I love the smell. Just smell. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful. Anyway, I'll get there. Um, so my father went out into the central Australia um, to find himself, of course. And in that journey, he found a whole group of, of friends that then supported him and he supported them uh, for the rest of his life. You all look too young to me what I can see, to have heard of a man called Albert Namajira, the painter. No? Okay. Anyway, uh, West, you've heard yes. of him? Oh, okay. Western Arundel man who had struggled uh, to find enough food from working for his family. In the late 1920s, there'd been the most horrendous drought in Central Australia and 80% of the children died during that time. And so can you imagine losing 80% of your children? But Albert was an amazing man, and I remember him very well. He was tall, Western Arunda, very quiet, very serene person who was very much part of his land. And he looked at father's watercolours paintings. He was, my dad was a painter, of course. And he said, this man sees my country better than anybody else sees it. And so he said, how much does this fellow get for these paintings? And when he was told 20 quid, oh, that was like a million dollars to Albert. So he went to dad and said, you fellow, you teach me this painting business and I teach you my culture and show you places. And so the agreement was made and the, West, the rest is history. So the dilemma that my father had in the 1930s was that bush-born First Nations people were unable to leave their um, mission stations or reserves they were put on. They were not allowed to access the city or media or anything like that. So they really couldn't get the story out of, of their skill base or their talents. And so when Dad tried to take these little watercolour paintings that absolutely sparkled of the hot breeze of the outback and the, and the incredible colour in the landscape, when he took those to the city, people wanted them. They wanted them desperately because the main people in the cities wanted to connect with First Nations people. You know, they're a bit, they're a bit sort of, you know, a bit scrunchy like that. You know, just put your fingers in. Yeah. Shh. Don't tell them. Don't tell them. Don't tell them. Yeah. 
Anyway. And so one really interesting story about Melbourne was that Dad wrote to that um, gilded manager of the Fine Arts Society and said, oh, look, I've got this young friend of mine who paints really well and, and we should have a one-man show of his work and it was really, really important that, that we did this. And, and uh, I've got the letter at home. Jack Gill wrote back and said, oh, I'm sorry, Batterby, not... Aboriginal people, we'll get a, a you know, woomera or, or something from the museum and have it on show as an icon and, and then you, you take his clothes off and take a photo of him with a spear or something but people won't be interested in that because to that time there was no Aboriginal art represented in any art galleries that was only ever seen as an uh, artisan object for museums. Well, Father was a mite upset and he wrote back and said that um, unless he accepted his friend's work on his say-so, he would get all of his peer artists to boycott the gallery. So anyway, it all happened. It was all fine. Albert didn't have to take his clothes off. So I was a child in the 1950s in Central Australia and I was so fortunate to have grown up around the Western Aranda community. So when Dad and Albert were there painting under the tree and there were so many other artists followed in that art movement. So at one time there was 20 people painting with Father in that whole movement. I was that little feral kid running along the dry riverbeds eating bush tucker. I am just so amazed at how blessed I was. And so along those dry riverbeds, and for people in other countries, they think of rivers as having water, not in the centre. Maybe it's a week in a whole year when you actually have water in a riverbed and it's very quick and very violent and it just goes away as quick as it comes. But what you're left for the rest of the year is a wonderful resource for the, the native food plants to be surviving really well. So the edge of that riverbed was always this wonderful, red, hard-packed clay side. And so the women with their digging sticks would just chip away where they recognised a particular spot. Um, it's Cyperus bulbosa I have in here. Western Aranda, call it langua. Yeah, darling, you help me. Okay. So this tiny little bulb was what we would dig out of that dry riverbed bank. And this is a very significant little plant. I dug these on Saturday and at home I have a wood fire stove and I then roasted them. So what you can see here is a tiny little yam, Cyperus bulbosa, as I said, but it has like a, a skin like an onion skin to it. And when you carefully, once it's roasted, you can squash it like that and it comes off and then you eat one. And it's, it's kind of a kind of a rich um, goodness kind of taste. It smells nutty when you roast it, and this is such an important resource of protein and renewable resource within the landscape of my childhood. As I said, this is a treasure that I hold very dearly because the buffalo grass that came in, feral grasses, feral weeds and feral animals have dispossessed a lot of our arid zone native foods. Oh, there's a story there, isn't there? It's a funny little paradigm, yeah. Anyway, these little yelka, which are really important, have been choked to the verge of extinction. 
And so I kindly ask you all to help in any way that you can to preserve this fine little thread of happiness to my childhood. Thank you.